Hey there, I'm Jo, and this is Looking Outside. Join me and some of the most influential and original thinkers in business and beyond as we explore fresh takes on familiar topics. Identity. It's a big word. What does it mean at the individual, social, national level? It's definitely a term that's commonly used in business when we try to understand cultural groups of people. It's a word that is arguably oversimplified, definitely politicized. To dive into this one, I'm going to be speaking with Theophilus Wells IV, who is an incredibly reflective, introspective, philosophical, poetic man, and someone I met for the first time the other day is deeply creative human being, and I'm so happy to have you on the show. Welcome, Theo. Thank you very much, Joanna. I appreciate it. I, f- I feel like that was such like a powerful introduction. I feel like I have something, I like, like a standard to uphold right now. Yeah, the pressure's on now. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Let's start maybe with you telling the audience a little bit about who you are. I'm Theophilus Wells IV, as I've been pleasantly introduced. Um, I'm currently a strategy intern at Dentsu Creative. And before this, I was a freelance creative strategist and overall general philosopher and oyster connoisseur. Uh, a general philosopher. Not many people come on the show and describe themselves that way. And I think that's beautifully put because I, I do feel like that describes you really well. So have you always been sort of philosophically minded? Did that come from a form of study that you took or is it like a natural seeking of knowledge that you have? You know what? It's interesting you say that. So in my upbringing, things were always a bit chaotic. Also, you know, being a kid from New York, essentially, in different environments where I kind of had to think and, and to be you know, fully transparent, things were a bit hostile and um, definitely volatile. So I would always have to think before I did something or think before I go somewhere or think of the potential outcomes. I would even have to think of other people's perspectives, right? Like I would always wonder why there's fighting and arg- or arguing or why certain occurrences keep playing out. And then I would notice other people's perspectives. And ultimately, I would notice that people would never fully understand each other. You know, and people fighting to get their points or their ideas across. And then when words don't work, physicality happens. But even physicality doesn't create understanding. It just creates dominance. And even if the dominating idea rules over an area or or a person or a community, it doesn't necessarily mean, mean that it works for everybody involved. So in a way, I just start sitting back. I think it's such a a great reflection, um, particularly on the topic of identity, because identity feels like it's so linked to our own personal convictions. Like we are what we think, we are what we believe in. So are you therefore much more aware of your own convictions and, and beliefs before you express them? I think there's beauty in owning your convictions and beliefs and then deciding that what these convictions and beliefs are, are things that I'm willing to stand up for. I think quite often our convictions and our ideals are things that we adopt. And in that adoption rate, eventually over time, we lose the why in the adoption. We lose what it means for me here and now. And I think if we lose that here and now precipice, we overall, we lose the root, the ancestral root connected or the communal root or the prehistoric root connected in what we're owning today. I honestly think a lot of people now are holding on to their convictions, kind of like they're holding on to the income classes or they're holding on to um, their immediate benefit and gain versus what it means for other people. How much do you think our identity or our convictions, I guess, are for us ourselves, for the individual, versus should they be more about the collective and about society? I think society at different levels and at many levels, sorry, has certain limitations where I think there's altruistic beliefs and measures. I just don't know if that altruism benefits everyone. It's like when Trump was in office, right? We also have to respect there's a certain body of people that believed in Trump, right? Like Trump didn't just get here by himself. He was voted in. Does Trump represent a larger body of people outside of his base? Not exactly. He actually kind of offends that base. But let's remove him. 
does a body of people that elected Trump in also represent the base outside of that body? Not necessarily so. And I think that's somewhat part of the issue is that we would like things to be for the collective, but I honestly think, I don't think it's malicious, but I think there is a certain um, limitation within the ability to see and understand others and their intrinsic stories. And as long as we never fully understand their stories, we'll usually make categorical judgments that have nothing to do with them and more to do with our own limitations. And do you think that that categorical assumption of people, is that because we as human beings are lazy and we try to create like simplicity (laughs) for ourselves? Or do you feel like a part of it is that we do like to, you know, we other each other, we like to create separation from ourselves and other people? I think there's a space for categories, but I also believe when the categories aren't working, we need to go back to the old school, like one of the oldest scientific methods of all, which is just basic observation. What is happening here? What is the story? And I think when we look at it from that perspective, we can now see it for what it is versus to say, well, X didn't happen, therefore it doesn't exist in this community or in these spaces, yet maybe it shows up in a different way. And I think categories, it's not necessarily that we're lazy. In many situations, we've never had to think that far. So Theo, I'm really curious about something you said before, because, you know, the brand of New York, particularly in advertising, and particularly being more of a, you know, blue state, it feels like it would be more one of the, oh, this is a terrible word to use, like easier easier places to try to create, like for someone to go into a specific industry would be easier. Is that a false assumption? It it depends on who's looking at that as advantage. For instance, let's say there's more opportunities in New York to get into advertising. What's interesting enough, if there's more opportunities and there's more businesses and practices that put themselves in the category of advertising, yet we notice that in the more of those categories, we see more of the same. In that sameness, it's also reflective of a missed opportunity. For instance, let's say we wish to diversify, yet we open up more businesses or, or we, we franchise our practice, and yet the other locations that pop up also show less diversity or show the same amount of diversity. So it's more of a resource concept and it's more of an access point than it is is the opportunity there. Again, people have different experiences, right? So I'll give you a better context of this. Um, I come from a Black Panther family, father, aunts, uncles, whole nine. In the original inception of the, of the term Black Power, it was coined by Stokely Carmichael. Stokely Carmichael only coined the term truly because he was really pissed off because I think within the month prior to that, his best friend got shot and killed on the way to go vote. And he was also a student at Ole Miss. Now, the friend's experience to go and vote, yes, the opportunity to vote is there, but what he experienced while going to vote, as the friend went to go vote, the opportunity to vote is there for everyone, but the experience that he incurred may not be an experience that other people have. So what we're getting to now is the dynamic of difference. And if we could look at, in my opinion, these differences of experiences of people in general, Now we can understand their stories. And once we understand their stories as marketers, as advertisers, as businessmen, as companies, we can now serve better. And not just like sell our concept, but say, but what are these people experiencing? What are their tension points or pain points as we call them so often? I think we're not fully looking at the story. So to take it back to advertising in New York, it's a similar thing in a way. What is the experience? I like the idea of like for businesses thinking about it much more in the context of moments, people's moments and experiences and to your point, pain points versus I think what a lot of businesses feel is that they have to solve all of the foundational systemic problems in the world for people. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's a broad thing to do. That's a tall order for businesses, especially in America, because businesses in America are frequently charged with having a community presence and, and, a, and a, a commitment to change. But what we've historically seen in many concepts is advancement, but it's like advancement with like a, not like a catch, but it's advancement that 
kind of feels Sealing-esque and also feels categorical. I think if we remove the capitalistic elements that companies are showing, we can now get to just serving someone. Just the idea of at least saying, this is what people experience at point X. And that's it. And I think at least acknowledging it, it puts a voice to it. It's, it's kind of like the women who for years were saying something about Harry Weinstein. For years. Like, why was no one listening? It's a huge thing, because if people are saying something and they're saying, this is what our experience is, right? This is what we are encountering and no one is doing anything about it, then it's kind of like, well, why are we not listening? That's more of the better question in my, in my approach. And, or even more in a toxic nature, you can hear, well, this is the way it is. That's also a very um, scary ideology because that exact phrase has been used to demonize and also um, oppress progress in many ways. And I think, I don't know, I think businesses, it's, there's so much of the look of how can we gain and how can we get something versus how can we give something? And I think if you just look at people's experience, you know exactly what to give. I think you touched on something really interesting there, um, going back to the categorization of people is the example of women sort of speaking out about Harvey and good old Harvey is that sometimes we choose not to listen to some of the things that we're hearing because we don't want to change it. Or to your point, we say, well, it's just the way that it is. We can't change it. And then I think sometimes we go on the flip side and we don't say, you know, how could women have a safer, more comfortable place to work that's more... (laughs) Where they, don't exactly. get, where they don't get mistreated versus, for example, all men are evil and all men have the intention of abusing women. So sometimes we don't look at going back to what you said before, the experience and how do we improve the experience within the context that we're in now versus we turn straight to demonizing people. Yeah. And, and I think if, I don't know, if we just take a step back. Right. Mm -hmm. Like like a great example of that is women's experiences in the workplace. Historically, what's been experienced. It's kind of (laughs) ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? Like it's 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 completely and utterly ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Right? I work at place X. That's it. I work there. Right. How does harassment become a part of that? How does a sailing become a part of that? How in this world of me working here and I'm competent, does this become, I had a great idea, but for whatever reason it was silenced or for whatever reason it wasn't received or it was just kind of marginalized. I don't know. It's kind of like, how did this happen? You know, and I think if we just look at the experience, then we could all ask the same question. Like, wait, why is this even happening? Why is this a thing? Like, nope, she had a great idea. Why are we cutting her off when she talks? You know what I'm saying? Like, it makes no sense. Yeah. But it's sort of, for me, it goes back to like a lot of the things that we hear about, you know, where where things could be improved and how we are today. So much of it feels so human. Like human beings are just so cruel by nature in many ways. And we're so competitive with one another. I saw a post on LinkedIn the other day, which was from a, not a contact of mine, but from a um, a black woman in business who was very successful. And she said, oftentimes it's the white women that try to tear me down in boardroom meetings because they feel threatened. Oh, that's her interpretation of it. But so much of that made me think, well, is it because she's black or is it because women are naturally more competitive or is it because people are competitive or is it because people are cruel? How much of it do you think is just like human nature? I, don't get me wrong. I think of a lot of it as human nature. I almost all of it in a way. But I also believe, and not to play this too much into your example, but I'm a firm believer in competition. I'm a competitive person. But I also believe that even competitions have rules. They're also overseen by someone, right? Usually a referee who's who's an unbiased person, right? Or sub- should be an unbiased person, right? I think when we now have competition and we're involving people's livelihoods and there's like this weird, like unfair play of the game, then now it creates 
not just am I competing, but now I have to be exceptional and I have to be like a therapist. And I got to think like 20 steps ahead to the point where like, yeah, like now I, I can't just be a football player to succeed. Now I have to be like, like an Emmett Smith. Like now I have to be like, like, like a great player who's super exceptional just to play the game. You know, and I think that's where things become a, a bit ridiculous. That and also, like we said, back to human nature and back to dynamics, that Black woman coming into that room is also in a room surrounded by what? And that's also an interesting dynamic that we have to respect, right? It's if the competitive playing field also doesn't look like me and maybe didn't have to go through my experiences to get in this room, then this field is different and I'm different from the field. And how do people tend to respond to differences? Is it with understanding? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. it's just it's a thing to look at. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious if you're comfortable sharing, because I, I, I'm really fascinated by what you said before about linking into what you bring of yourself uh, based on sort of who you are, where you came from, is your Black Panther family. How much do you feel like that's defined who you are like as you were growing up there were i imagine like certain expectations of what you should be doing with that family history or potentially you rebelled against it so how how is it growing up with that it's interesting because within that it's not that there's an expectation of who you should be right but there's a constant there's a constant platform for you to be who you are and that may come with affirmation, that may come with op opposition. But either way, you have to choose who you are and you have to know who you are. And that may even look like as a practice. For instance, my father asked me when I was eight years old, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right. And I said, president, I want to be a president. Right. And Amy? my father said, yeah, I'm, yes, be me in a nutshell. And my father said, no, you're not. You're a criminal. And he pointed a finger at me, right? He said, what do you want to be? I said, president, right? He said, no, you're not. You're a criminal, it's right? So he said, what do you want to be? And I said, a criminal? He's like, son, don't ever let someone else tell you who you are, what you want to be. Now, so what do you want to be? Mm. And I said, a president. He said, exactly. Don't ever let me change the way you think. <laughs> you know, and that's the beauty of it. It's deeper than ancestral things or where you come from. It's way deeper than that. It's more so of who are you here and now in this moment. And that's, that's most important, like as a human being, like who are you choosing to be? And to be honest, I think whenever we can tap into humanity at a base level, especially in things like advertising, because we're, we're daring to tell the stories of people. I think when you can tap into humanity at a base level, you can assist it. And I think the assistance of it improves it. And it kind of gets us all away from the noise. Yeah. You are so endlessly quotable. Uh, daring to tell. <laughs> daring to tell the stories of people. I love that so much. So I have a question for you in relation to that, which is sort of linked to what you just said before, where we choose who we are, which I, I also agree with. I think it's a balance of obviously nature, nurture, how you grew up and who you grew up with to give you inspirational provocation like your dad did, but also then what, what choices you make about yourself, what you choose to believe and what you choose to do. So in psychology, identity is defined by a combination of three things, discovering your own potential, choosing your purpose and expressing yourself. So I was thinking about this and arguably people express themselves, but not everybody knows what their potential is. Not everybody is in tune with what their strengths are and not everybody knows what their purpose in life is. Some people are wanderers and they continue to wander and wander and wonder uh, about what they should be. Mm -hmm. So when we're telling the stories of people, particularly in business, do you feel like we make the assumption that people have worked themselves out and they do already know what their purpose is and they know, they know what they're good at and they know what they're doing in life and maybe maybe that's a false assumption? I think there are many things that could also keep people from not knowing themselves, right? Like consumerism is one of them, right? Like consumerism and the idea of us always wanting more or, you know, we have the thing where people uh, have like retail therapy, right? And now they buy to feel, right? Or people purchase to be happy versus they're happy and then they make a purchase. I think it can throw off identity a bit. And I also think um, it's interesting 
when there's hyper interconnectedness? Are we connecting to feel something? Like, are we connecting to have community and to have like minds? Or am I just wishing to be included? Because being included makes me feel like I'm something or like I'm important versus I'm already important whether I'm included or not. And I think that as advertisers, we do assume that. And I think also we frequently don't have the time to slow down or we don't make the time to slow down to see what's going on with humanity and people or, or the person. And again, it falls into now, you know, the one of the worst at, like age old concepts, which is how is my idea? How is this thing that I've created helping to give someone what they want? And then it becomes deeper when it's like, yeah, but why do they want it? It's like someone who overeats wanting something else to eat. They want something else to eat. But now the, the real question is, why are they overeating? You know, what is the emotional connection to that? What is happening at the core? And it almost would behoove me to respect that because now it's actually dangerous if I just keep feeding them more of what they want, even though they're overeating. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I think that's important just to care. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it is important to care. I think it's interesting also from your perspective of creating ideas, like you called yourself the idea, idea man. Yeah, someone someone called me the idea guy, and I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah, I would take that. Yeah. So when it comes to ideas, do you tend to find them or create them? I think ideas are less about you. How could I take in all this stuff and all these, these concepts and what I've just seen and how can I submit to it and let the idea come to me? And it's not just giving people an experience, it's creating something that they themselves can even align with. Like when you see the thing that doesn't just excite people, but like it represents them. Because if we get caught up in experiences and what we can give to people as far as experiences and whatever new product thing, it doesn't really become an extension of them. It becomes, it becomes a filler to a small want and the wants change every second. Yeah, and we don't stop wanting. <laughs> yeah, we never stop. We're ridiculous. Humans are yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> we, are ridiculous. Like, we want everything. All the time. Just going back to what you said before about creating an idea that almost gives back to people, gives them something. It's a very caring concept and it's, it's very positive as well, which I find that you come across like you are a very naturally positive person. Thank you. But also very honest and frank, obviously, and like not a not a sort of a false positivity. But there's something really powerful in our first conversation that you said, which I, I it's one of those conversations that I wish I had recorded. It's like, oh, it was so good. <laughs> um, but it was about adding in more good versus removing the bad. I think that we, we mm. tend to, in business, in ourselves, we tend to be really obsessed with like removing all of our faults and removing the the flaws of our past. And sort of like fixing everything instead of, I guess, sort of linked to what you said just then is like just sitting with things, yeah. maybe with a sense of acceptance. I think I'm a balanced individual, right? And, and when I say balance, I believe highly in balance, you know, like like the old adage, what is it? Um, As above, so below, as without, as within, as what was, as what will be, right? It's like how people could obsess to say, well, bad things always happen to me. And they have a story within that that connects with that. But thankfully, the world is bigger than us as people. And good things also happen as well. And that's just balance, right? Bad things do happen, but good things happen as well. That's just balance, right? And I'm not going to be such an asshole to say, well, only focus on, you know, the good. You need to have space to say, yeah, but this bad thing just happened. You know, I kid you not, I just, I, and I'll be fully transparent, I just had a, a, an emotional moment this morning because my baby girl, oh, love my daughter, man. It's like the most precious, like one of the most precious things to me in this world. She gave me some interesting news that I wasn't that thrilled to hear. And as a father, I was so taken aback by it. Not that it was about me per se, but I just, I just wasn't happy to hear it. And I was like, damn, dude, you got to do something. And I need to have space to feel that. 
I can't just say, well, let's just focus on the positive. That'd be so irresponsible and it's completely ignorant and it's insensitive. And I honest, I honestly think we do that so much to each other that it's kind of ridiculous when we need to have the space to let the negative happen and not just to appreciate the positive, but because everything in life has a flow. I would be so insensitive if I was like, you know, there's peaks and valleys, but if you just focus on the peak, no, but sometimes you fall into a valley and it sucks. <laughs> you know, like, in, and then you have to work out what's happening in the valley and then how to get the hell out of the valley. So yeah, you got to focus on the peak, but you also have to acknowledge where you currently are to, to respect how to navigate out of it. But also to respect the stories of other people who also fell in some valleys. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, this is going to be a really bad analogy, but it's <laughs> like a valley instead of sort of covering it up with a tent. So people don't see it, but they might fall back into it. It's almost like le not leaving it there, but either pave completely paving it in or just seeing it for what it is so that you don't fall back into that, uh, that hole. Right. So, yeah. It's like what you're saying there is like leaving the space for the things that were so that you can learn from them, right? And you can accept them. But the learning is a beautiful thing because the learning is not just for you. You know, like it's my hardships, though I won't complain about them, they're beautiful because they help me to throw someone else a, a rope where it's like, hey, don't go there. I went there. It really sucked. <laughs> right? Or, hey, this thing that seems like a good thing is not a good thing. Go around it. Right? It allows us all to now improve and advance. But also, we have to be able to acknowledge those stories. Again, it's irresponsible of us to say, well, yeah, these things don't happen. No, they do. And there's a bunch of stories that, that show they do. Again, it's, it's like the Harvey Weinstein thing, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, he's, he's not that bad of a guy. He's He's a monster. Like, like, do you hear what these people are saying? Like, this woman has traumatic events. Like, she's, she'll never be the same again. We have to look at these things. You know, and I think, again, I think balance is needed. You know, to take it, you know, back to the Harvey Weinstein example. It's not to say, well, yeah, we have to, you know, arm women to be prepared for these things. I also think we need to create safe spaces where that shouldn't even be a concern or a thought why should she have to prepare to deal with that? She's just trying to be an actress. You know, like that's not fully fair to her because now she's taking time away from perfecting her craft to perfecting how to navigate this valley that other people have been in, but no one ever threw a rope in. It's not fully fair. Yeah. So one question that has just been like bouncing around in the back of my uh -oh. noggin which uh, as you were talking, I'm like, oh, I really want to ask him this. So what, like, <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, do you still want to be president? You know what? Okay. I think Picasso said it best. But Picasso said his mother wanted him to be a doctor. And then he said, instead, I chose to paint and I became Picasso. I think it's more of that. I, I believe every day I'm being more of who I am and being more of who I am, I'm being who I'm supposed to be. And to be honest, for me now, presidency is too small, especially when you inco incorporate politics. God, I hate politics. <laughs> I just do. God, it's the most annoying thing ever. I'll high five that. Yeah. It's yeah, just it's, such a uh, time. It's a time waster. Going back to what you were saying before about you need you already lacking time and space for the things that matter, even if it's introspection and all of that stuff. Just well, well, and we're worried about in politics. We're so worried about not who to be but we're worried about what to say. And it's interesting if I'm saying something, but I'm also not being it. You're like, who, who are you? Yeah. And that's confusing, right? <laughs> like, it's yeah. like you've been saying one thing, but you've been being something else. I don't know who to expect anymore. And that's not really fair to people. I think it's more admirable, actually, if you could be who you are and say, well, this is the thing, the mess that I am, right? This is the beautiful thing that I am. Here's the chaos that I am. And someone can choose to say, you know what? And I like this guy. Yeah. Imagine what a role model that would be, too, because, you know, arguably we're seeing the most powerful man in the world, whoever that is in that point in time, say one thing, do something else. What does that teach people is acceptable? What does that teach children? Exactly. And then you're taught also to play a game, but the game deals more so with not just who you are, but how you are perceived. And, and don't get me wrong. 
I would be immature if I were to say that the perceptions of people are, quote unquote, not important. I like to believe that in my core, but also have to respect the reality of it, right? And the perceptions of people have and do affect lives. I just finished reading Ken Honda's Happy Money. And in it, he talks about what people do in the pursuit of money and our attachment to that. You know, you could you could talk about working at a job you don't like. You could talk about somebody doing something with a boss that maybe they're not proud of. So many things that now say, what are we doing for this thing? And it's scarier when it works. What we tend to see in the ad industry politics, right? We could say um, people may be in positions where they are noticing their spaces and places with other people. And it's worked thus far, right? So it's continuously done, even if it may be at the disadvantage of someone else, i.e., let's not throw the rope. Or i.e., let's not even look at this valley because we're all here. When Maybe we're not at the peak, but we're close. We're all here together. And I think it's a, it's a more interesting conversation because there's stories in all of it. And if we look at that story, if we look at the story to say the person who, who brings up the problem becomes the problem, right? If we look at that story to the people who believe that that person is the problem, we now have a new story to look at. And I say, well, what's happening here? Yeah, going full circle back to the example of, of Trump at the start of the conversation and what does he represent for people? Or what are people connecting with? Or what's the unspoken yeah. voice that he's on the podium giving an opportunity for us to hear versus what is he and is he bad or good, right? What does he stand for? I really like that. Theo, thank you so much for coming on the show. I have one last question for you before I let you go. Of course, of course. No, you, I can always do this with you. You're great. Yeah, great. Well, I'll have to I'll have to bring you back. I think we could definitely do uh, <laughs> take two and take on another rich and, and meaty topic. So my last question for you is uh, obviously you're you're constantly sort of looking outside of the things that are familiar to you. I feel like you you're kind of just like taking in the world. But what is your go to when you're trying to push yourself to look outside? Oh, it's easy. I think that's simple. Open your eyes. It was Buddha that said, the finger that points to the moon is not the moon. What we can foolishly do is be obsessed with the finger and stop looking at the moon. So all you have to do is just look. Be fascinated, because things are fascinating. You know, like it's, it's like a gardener, man. I'm not going to lie. It's pretty dope, right, <laughs> to, to prune a plant. And it comes back like, holy crap. <laughs> right? Like it's, it, there's such marvels of the world that it's kind of crazy how we can make things so much about ourselves. It's interesting. It's, it's the responsibility of us that brings us expansion. And if we could be responsible enough to look at someone else and not make it about us for like 10 seconds, you're like in wonder, right? Like like, like my, my son, my son is fascinating. Oh, he's been fascinating since childhood. And he's clever and he's a genius, right? And like one time, um, <laughs> my son's mother was, was punishing him by unplugging his nightlight, right? And one day she goes to his nightlight and she calls me up. She's like, Theo, you have to get him. He's, he's losing his mind. I'm like, well, what happened? She's like, he super glued the nightlight into the outlet, <laughs> right? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, wait, wait, he did what? And she's like, he's super glued the nightlight. I'm like, he's a genius. <laughs> I'm like, he's, he's, he's like five. I'm like, he's like a little Einstein. <laughs> like, I'm like, so like, I think I'm, I find things fascinating. But we just look at them and we sit in astonishment at how amazing they already are. And I think it's just that simple. And I like to be in spaces with other people who are also astonished. You know, like, like no complaining. There's nothing to really complain about. Because complaining is more about me. You know, it's more about I didn't get X. Yeah, but you also got, you know, A through Q, you know, like, and what is this that you received? So I, that, that's how my expansion always happens. I dare to read, I dare to look, I dare to think, and I dare to not make things about me or judge them. Because the moment we judge it, we cut off the learning experience. Yeah, lean into the curiosity and the, the wonder of the world. Theo, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. You got me talking about my little ones now. I'm, all, I'm not teary-eyed, but you just got me all amazed again. <laughs> <laughs> 
how great they are. I hope you enjoyed this slightly philosophical, definitely thoughtful conversation with the almost lyrical Theo. If you did, please follow and rate the show. Until next time, keep looking outside.